and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two of my good brothers here. We have the Living Encyclopedia and the Flamboyant Flyer, who is cr who is probably currently gr currently grounded for trying to f for trying to fly donuts again. <laughs> Good, br good brother Flutter, and we have the and we have the man who is ta who is taking over your anime and is and is now and is now fully re fully recovered for fully recovered after spending a weekend in the nice boat support group. <laughs> good brother Shades. All right, monkey got me on that one. <laughs> If I if I can get away if I if I can if I have to make if I had to make jokes for weeks about Cure being in um in le in leaf fan therapy, um I think I can I think I can get that one out of my system. Yeah no 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 I've got no complaints about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I ended up having to use your phrase earlier when I was wa when I was watching the Vikings game today. Which one? Uh, Vikings Bengals. No, uh, like what which phrase? I hate my fucking state. <laughs> Loss in OT, first game, first week, against the fucking Bungles. <laughs> oh, I'm sure Adonis and uh, Urinating Tree had a field day with that one. Oh, they they did, and I'm I'm looking forward to the, to um to seeing that to seeing them ro to seeing them roast it. <laughs> anyway, so it's been a while since we t since we truly d did a deep dive when it comes to tokus when it comes to tokusats that isn't us um isn't us doing f um fans um fan creation kind of things because we did because we did the. We did the Gaim L5R cr crossover thing, but when it comes to delving in, when it comes to delving into Power Rangers, we haven't done that for, I'd say, the better part of a year. The last, the last time I remember us delving into Power Rangers was the question of whether a movie can work. But I, so I had, I had, I had considered how to how to go about this, and then I remembered that there that um, given my talk of of nostalgia and how and how I will repeatedly um, kick kick the kick while they're down the pe the people who um who are reliant on their nostalgia, especially the, especially those in my own area of expertise because because fu because that version of the OSR can fuck off <laughs> along with it along with anyone who says that along with anyone who tries to say that I have to. I have to use the same th the same three authors for my um, RPG inspirations when it comes to fantasy games. I have no you guys you guys can go fuck yourselves with a fucking loaf of bread sideways after it's <laughs> after it's been after it's been date after it's been out in the sun for a day and the loaf of bread is a baguette. <laughs> but when, but there is and I. I um I don't get to express it often, but I'm as much I'm as much of a fan of Power Rangers as, as anybody else here in the temple. And there's and there's been it's up there's been its ups and downs over the years, but there's one particular era that I find fascinating because there was genuine hope for a hot minute and that and a lot of people thinking that we we're gonna be going back to the old days, which was the which was the curse of this er of this era. This week we are looking back at what could arguably be the a low a low point, the, a deceptive low point for for um, for Power Rangers as a brand. This week, the Neo Saban era, a post mortem. And as I promised, Good Brother Shades, I will let you take take the helm in setting the in setting the stage for this. All right, thank you very much, there, Mr. Monk. So, this all started at near the uh, near the probably around 2010, after the 
quality, the high point in quality wise, but the low point in ratings of Power Rangers RPM, mainly because Disney was truly done with this franchise at that point. And they showed it by trying to reboot Money Morphin with the absolutely terrible comic art style effects oh, that yeah. we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. But just when it seemed like Power Rangers was finally going to be put on the shelf for good, Saban announces that they have swooped in and has rescued Power Rangers from Sissy's clutches and we're planning to bring the series back with the next season, Power Rangers Samurai. Al, when this happened, the fan base at the time had their arms raised to the sky in praise going, the Power Rangers, tr the true run of Power Rangers has will have returned. Despite the fact that the Disney era, when you really look back, wasn't really all that bad, except for a few notable exceptions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... So everyone was, and of course, this was also happening as the 20th anniversary of Power Rangers was literally right around the corner. So the <laughs> hype was high for what Power Rangers was going to do, especially since there was an anniversary season they had footage for. And it was very, very likely that that footage was going to be used for Power Rangers. Oh, how wrong, how, how, how much we wish they hadn't at this point, but we will get to that. Mm-hmm. So thus, we arrive in, I think it was 2011, I believe. Let me double check my numbers here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. February 2011, Power Rangers Samurai makes, start, hits the airwaves. And there are a couple of factors as to right off the bat that we need to discuss before we really start diving deep. And the biggest of which is that as part of the revival, the, the part of this rescue and revival of Power Rangers... It was moved from, obviously, Disney to Nickelodeon. Now, in and of itself, this was understand. It made sense why Nickelodeon was the choice. It's a kid's, it's a kid's show. It belongs on a kid's network. However, Nickelodeon, right off the bat, basically to put a huge weight on this thing by enforcing a policy that Nickelodeon has had when it comes to all their shows that, all, that every season of any show they, uh, that's done has to be 20 episodes. No more, no less. And this, considering that most Power Rangers seasons can go over 40 episodes, this presented a problem right out the fucking gate. <laughs> oh, just fact that we had to deal with this because it forced Saban to have to split up Power Rangers into two seasons per series. So we had Samurai and because of Nickelodeon's bullshit we also had Super Samurai even though really nothing changed. Only one season actually did something different in the second half and again we will get to that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. But this is when we start diving in. We, we really need to, and this is where we're going to start pointing out our first big name of problems here, because it, trying the biggest problem right off the bat was that as because this was bringing the franchise back to Saban's hands, they wanted to recapture a lot of the earlier zeitgeist from back in 1993 and 94 when Power Rangers was at its absolute phenomenal heights. So it tried to ape a lot of the same feelings with similar sounds, images, characters, and things like that to try to bring, make people feel that this was Power Rangers again. You know, again, that nostalgia. And this is where, but right off the bat, as you will soon discover, that reliance on nostalgia was poorly handled and thus only caused us to wish for the past again, not for this. The thing about... I, if, I, if I can speak for a moment on the matter. The yeah. thing about um, nostalgia <clears throat> is that chasing nostalgia is very analogous to Sisyphus pushing up the boulder. Because because as f you can get it you can get as close as possible to that to that but the feel but even at its height even at the height of reaching for nostalgia that feeling is fleeting at best and inev and inevitably 
you're going to get pushed back down the hill with the boulder, and you're going to have to tr you're going to have to try and push yourself push. And if you want to keep going for that nostalgia, you have to keep going more and more to try to try and reach to try and reach the idea of that height. You are you are he you are um, you are being sold on the idea rather than the actuality. Um, if I can use a wrestling example of this kind of thing, you often hear pe there's there's a there's a significant disconnect between people who have um, have a nostalgic view of the Attitude Era versus the versus the people who have actually gone back and watched um, Raw and Nitro from the from those days and come to the realization a lot of these a lot of these episodes were shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got to be willing to take off your rose-colored glasses every once in a while and actually take a look back, because the biggest thing we see with Samurai is that, and, and this is actually something that's kind of prevalent throughout the Neo Saban era, is that they were trying to capture the glory days of Power Rangers, but the problem was is that they focused exclusively on not just MMPR, but Season 1 MMPR. Where it really hadn't found its footing yet. Yeah. Yeah. I'd I'd argue I'd argue that the um, the era the era that I think a lot of people are n are nostalgic for where it seemed to really get its footing and get its and get its identity was um, season two onward of MMPR. Yeah, season two with the introduction of Lord Zed, the uh, and the ongoing stories with that was where it really started to come together. I mean, it still had some kinks to work out, and season, you know, by I'd say by I say Zio was at its absolute best quality of the old days, mm -hmm. where every mm -hmm. the stories were solid, everything was consistent, and you know everything was well developed. But yeah, to try to go back to season one MMPR when it was a complete and utter mess, you know, because nothing like this had been done before, just seems like the wrong place to be aiming your targets. Mm-hmm. Now, I I do remember that there, I do in addition to the um the fe the feeling of oh we're go oh we're gonna get we're gonna be going back to the good old days from the fan base, I do remember that there was a massive um push, like you had chief among that being having the ca having the um, samurai suits shown at um. At the at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, you had that. Yeah. There was there was there was talk there was talk of it. There was a lot of talk about expanding merch. There was a lot there was a lot of talk about um about tr about trying again with um do, with doing a film, which we will get to. There and the, and there was talk about exp about expanding, basically tr basically trying to tr trying to turn um Power Rangers from just a show into in, into a full into a full on IP umbrella that could be that could yeah. be utilized for other matters, and while that did and while that did happen, I'd sit and I'd say there and there were a couple successes. Um, you know, you know the old saying, "One bad apple spoils the bunch," which um, that I think that's a very good segue to bring into Samurai, which I this is one of those I will die on this fucking hill and I will and I will die standing like Benkei Musashibo. Or Musashi Bo Benke, depending on how you want to go about it. <laughs> samurai should never have been sh sa sh Samurai. If you wanted to do another season, Shinkenger should have been off the table. Yeah. Agreed. Samurai Sentai Shinkenger was a very Japanese uh, inspired and influenced. Sentai. Mm -hmm. It was steeped deep in Japanese culture, mythos, just everything about it was j pure Japanese. Now, to be fair, we've loved ourselves some Japanese stuff here in America. You know, ninjas are a popular thing for a reason, but even then, it's always been, it's never been to this level. So to try to adapt this, and especially the way they did was a mistake. And one of the and this is where we get to the first big problem with samurai specifically is that and and for this we need to bring up the na a name that is going to be synonym that's going to be heavily connected to the first two series of the, of the Neo Saban era 
the uh, head executive produ- the head producer and writer for the series, the showrunner basically, one Jonathan Zacker. Now, Zacker had been involved with Power Rangers from the beginning, so it under it made sense for Saban to tap them to come back and do this show, at least from a business standpoint. Like, but as even Linkara pointed out. Zacker had not done television, a, a full TV production like this in decades. They had pretty much been off the market since Wild Force. Mm-hmm. And even then, there were issues, as we'll get into here in a little bit. Mm-hmm. But the biggest thing that Zacker tried to do with Samurai was he wanted to basically recreate Shinkenger in Power Rangers. It is the perfect example of what we call a cut, copy, and paste. Because many of the elements of the story in Samurai were lifted directly from Shinkenger. And even if you don't even if you don't watch the Sentai or have never seen anything Sentai related ever, it is painfully obvious with the way the story is written that this was not something that they made up themselves. Mm-hmm. Oh, clearly. <laughs> And I, I want I want to make I want to make clear that when it that um, <clears throat> whenever I whenever I bring up the no, the notion of of it be, of it being t- of it being far too mm-hmm. Japanese, of Shinkenger being far too Japanese, a lot a lot of people will go, but but couldn't the same thing be said about about her, about Hurricane and Kaka Ranger? Not, not really. Um, Hurricane not not by much um and and again and again you have the fact that nit that there was that whole ninja craze in the 80s and yeah. to and to an and to an extent the early 90s so you have that to to kind of build to kind of build upon um but 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 um samurai didn't samurai didn't have that pop culture zeitgeist at that time and it re- and it really ha- it really ha- it really hasn't it's just been an a- it's just been an aspect that's been, that's been dipped into when anime started expl- started really exploding in the 2000s closest thing to a samurai related thing that had any kind of popularity here in the west was the tom cruise movie the last samurai and even then it really didn't cause the same kind of explosion that the ninja <laughs> that the ninja craze did so that that kind of hampered it right out the gate, but it wasn't even just the suit designs or the use of the folding zords or the morphers or anything like that. No, we the real problem with the aping the, this cult, trying to ape this Sentai was the story itself, because the idea of a group of a group of rangers who are basically conscripted. They were basically brazed at birth to become a team of heroes when this need arise and be summoned the way they did and have to live the way they do in this show. In America, it makes absolutely no fucking sense to do that kind of thing. And in fact, it, I guarantee you a lot of people would have looked at that a lot if, if a lot of group, a lot of conservatives probably would have been pissed at this show if they actually knew what was going on because of how this is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? And for once, I actually agree with them on this because it was barely done. But in Japan, that kind of tradition and that kind of race to 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 a certain job, that's kind of the norm for them. So a show like Shinki, Lyle Pilot, yeah, that kind of thing is the is a very common thing in Japan. Families are raised and uh, grown are basically taught to fill a certain job that they that their family has done for generations. Yes, there are outliers, there are people who break away, but more often than not, if you are a part of a certain family, you are likely going to be working a specific job. Mm-hmm. That's just how that works. And Samurai is a very good example of that. But Or Shinkenger was a good example of that. But Samurai, to have us do it, doesn't make any sense. Oh, not at all. Yeah, the... The other... Th- the, other th- the other thing... To t- to take into account is is the fact that a lot a lot of the a lot of the monsters are ve- are very cl- are very clearly based on um on ja- on Japanese folk tales which is which is why they which is why they're called ayakashi the f- 
the uh, there are heavy, heavy nods to Kabuki theater, to the point that you have the Kurokos um, constantly, constantly setting, constantly setting up a stage just be just before just before a um, transformation scene happens. Um, Not only that, the first appearance of Ryu Nosuke is basically him in the middle of a performance. The the thing that the thing that I should note is um, Kurokos are basically stagehands in Kabuki theater. Um, and of course, you also you also have the whole, the whole gimmick of 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 magic through um, writing mm -hmm. through, through right yeah. through writing through writing Japanese characters and the and the equivalent of a of a um, shikigami with the, with what would become the folding zords. That, in addition to the concept of the Kage Musha, which is why you have two, which is why you have two reds in this series because of that particular motif. Now, the concept of a body double has been has been seen in has been seen in um, Western fiction. Um, I think I think one example that comes up from my from my childhood is the Prince and the Pauper. Yeah, but the but the but the way that Kage Musha, which means shadow warrior, in context is a is a body double for for say a sho for say a shogun, and is typically used to draw to draw their attention while while the actual shogun does the does the real work, you know, and and is is fully intent is fully prepared to die by by assassins if that if that happens to be the case. That's not that's not something that you really have much of a parallel for. And I do I do remember I do remember um in a in a forum discussion someone has suggested why why not go why not go with knights instead? You still have you still have if you were to even do that, you'd still have a lot of things that you still that you still need to work that you still need to work around. Yeah. The the biggest again being that whole traditional Braves to be for this job thing. That's that wasn't a thing the knights did. They were they chose to become knights. Mm -hmm. These got these these the samurai rangers and the shinhenders did not choose this. They were raised to be in this position. Mm -hmm. And and um, let's let's get let's get one, let's get one of the <laughs> obvious things out of the way. Um, <laughs> having <laughs> having a have. Trying to trying to sell trying to sell the whitest the whitest kid you know as having a Japanese last name. Jane uh. Shiba. Now, and this is another example of where the cut copying pasting really rears its ugly head because they were so lazy they did not even bother to change the name from the Sentai because the names of the family in the Sentai were the Shiba family. Mm -hmm. Takeru Shiba and Kaoru Shiba. Now, on one hand, I, as, I under, as I understand it, um, at the time, Toei had, this, Toei had the deal where you had to take the next season no, argu no um, arguments. Yeah. And... I think I think in the years past, because they realized how they painted themselves into a corner, um, you, we haven't seen we haven't seen that as much. No, after the net the season that we'll be getting to next, they kind of realized that this was going to cause more problems than it was worth. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. But when it but when it comes to now to, now to be fair, on one hand. I can understand the appeal of trying to of, of trying to adapt something like um, Samurai, because because of how popular Shinkenger was in Japan. Grant granted, yeah. some of that popularity ended up leading to other problems with within Super Sentai, like the re like the red question. Um, but that's but that's a story for another day. But at but at the sa at the same time. Because of the fact that you're that you're trying to that you're trying to bring in the, bring in that kind of that kind of zeitgeist, it was it was a poor move because of how dissimilar it was going it was going to be from a lot of the motifs that the that the old heads who were who were who were coming back for nostalgia purposes were um, were expecting. 
Yeah. The, the, the One of the big things is that because of the way Shin Kenjer was, adapting that caused the rest of the team to kind of get neglected for the most part. Like, yeah, they had a couple episodes here and there, but ninety like, at least a good 75% of the episodes were strictly focused on Jaden. Which, and, in a, which in a series like this, you don't, shouldn't really do. You should, you're supposed to develop all of the characters equally. There has there has been a formula over the years of fo- of focusing on the red. This is very much true. However, when you look when you look at seasons that came before, everybody did get their moment to shine. And I'm I'm, I'm excluding RPM in this because RPM was a much different beast where the big where the where the red focus was shifted over to focus, focusing on black. And even then, like, they had several, each of the other Rangers had several episodes where their importance was superly, was majorly highlighted. Mm -hmm. You know, Green had several episodes where he got to shine. Yellow had, Yellow got, while the weakest of the bunch, had some good episodes. Red got a chance to do things and then, but here, while the other Rangers do get an episode here or there, like, you know, you get one for Emily, you get one for Mia, one for Mike, one for Kevin... You know, they there were hardly anything, and see, even even the Six Ranger doesn't get much love in that regard. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> when it the I'd say, then there was the there was that interview that was done on Den of Geek talking about some of the behind the scenes issues with Samurai, and how it could have and how when we stop and think about it, it could have been a lot worse. Where yeah. one of the initial ideas, as I recall, was to have them either either be out in the city doing hero work or in or in the or in the Sheba house. Nowhere else. Yeah, that was kinda dumb. And 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 to, and, and I think one thing we do have to give a little slack to Samurai for is that because of how soon after the purchase this season came out it's pretty clear that the that the producers did not have enough time to really flesh things out. Mm-hmm. Oh no, not at all. However, I will I will I will maintain that yeah. um that G in the in that which another case of of trying of trying to do copy pasta uh, has has one has one of the as one of the most egregious um one of the mo- one of the most egregious. Um, pants on, pants on head, idiot moments of and of any mentor character. Because as you as you'll remember, when when our sixth is introduced, who is supposed to be Latino but is actually Thai. Whoops. <laughs> whoops. <laughs> he he and he had fi- he had figured out a, he had basically figured out a way to ha- to um. To re- to replicate to replicate his own version of the of the powers that ever of the symbol power that everyone else is using, communicate communicating with digital symbols instead instead of writing it the old fashioned way. And after after his after his day after his um show off moment, G decide G decides that he that he should have he should have the phone taken away from him because it's too dangerous for him. Because he doesn't have the "quote unquote" proper formal training that the others did. Mm-hmm. Which, well, which, well, yes, this they did this in Shinkenger. At least in Shinkenger, they did it more dignified because of the whole, because of what was going on in the background. They were explaining Genta and Takeru's relationship with each other at the same time. Yeah, just, here it's just like, nope, uh, you haven't been, tra- you haven't done the same training these guys did. You don't get to be a ranger. Excuse me, what? <laughs> and, and, and I love Linkara's rant on this. Like, uh, excuse me, who the fuck are you? <laughs> you don't even have a proper first name, and you're gonna tell these guys how to do it? <laughs> never mind. Never mind the fact that um, it that I'd say I'd say <clears throat> I'd I would I would say I would say when it comes to when it comes to the rest, a lot of a lot of. A lot of the, a lot of their, a lot of their character set, character setups were a case of, um, if you're go, if you're going to be transferring over 
characters from characters from your source material. Um, at least understand what you're transferring over because a lot of it reads very superficial, especially in the case of our blue. Because oh yeah, Kevin. Oof. In Shinkenger, he um well as as one as one of the monsters called him, he has a mother complex. <laughs> he, <laughs> He he is some he is somebody who ta who takes things ridiculously serious and um actually I'd I'd say I'd say a better comparison Ida from My Hero Academia. Oh, that's spot on. That's fucking yeah. spot on. But yeah. and Kevin does carry that over, but it does you know. And they did. I will give them credit. I'll give them a little credit for this because they did try to incorporate that into Kevin's character that he was training to be an Olympic swimmer. And had to give up his dream after all the training he had done for that to all of a sudden have to jump to being a samurai ranger, mm -hmm. and it it affected him. He, he's like, okay, well, if I have to, if I'm gonna have to give up the training I've done for this, I'm just gonna pour every bit of training into my in the samurai, and just go all in, even at the cost of his own sanity at times. Yeah. Now, this uh, this does br this. I'd would say I'd say one of the one of the biggest examples of n of not getting it is um oh hi Cole <laughs> oh oh yeah the whole thing of Decker oh god I want I want to make I want to make clear that um the wielder of Uramasa first it I will admit is one of my is one of my favorite designs of the, of that era and oh yeah. Juzo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he, but um here's here's a here's a case of not getting it. As I recall in the source material for one, they did not try and do the tragic backstory with him. He was hey. he, he was an asshole in life and he was an asshole after his death. So oh, much yeah. so that so much so that the Gadoshi wanted nothing to do with him. Part of the, part of that has to do with the fact that he's not a pure Gadoshu, but there's also the fact that the only thing he cares about is killing. Exactly. Yeah, here they kind of had to force that onto him as part of his curse, mm -hmm. and the whole Faustian bargaining thing just it just did it just caused a lot of problems because again, you know, Decker was just constantly seeking a duel and. Even when he got it, he didn't ever get what he want. He, apparently, he never got what he wanted because he just kept getting, you know, screwed over on every turn on that regard. There's all. There's also the fact that the reasoning for wanting a duel with Jaden specifically, the whole, ho the whole holding a secret. That secret is that secret is not a, is not as is is not oh. as um bur is not as burning a hole as as the implication is. It's a case where the t where the um, tell does not match the show. Yeah, that whole arc was dumb. Like, several times throughout the series, they allude to the fact that Jaden's hiding this big secret. Mm -hmm. But the secret was the secret that needed to be kept, and it wasn't something that was going to cause any problems. It was a case of, no, we're keeping it a secret because we don't want the Nylock finding out our plans. Not that it's going to hurt the family or cause a reputation to be shot or or cause or, or lead to some kind of big disaster. No, it's just no. We just don't want the Nylock finding out that we're we're working to kick your ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh God. And but but a lot but a lot of people but with even even with all of the if all of the issues, a lot of people had the the mindset that I remember at the time was. Okay, th we, there's definitely some problems, but 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 there, but it's um we can chalk this up to teething troubles, because you got a yeah. lot of people who've been out of the game for about a decade, so it's gonna, so ring rust is going to happen. Yeah, <clears throat> though we should also mention, speaking of having not been on the bike for a while, hi there, Paul Schreier, how you doing? <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> I let me let me get what let me get one thing out of my system. So Sh Schreier, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap you up in this nice protective little bubble, and I'm gonna put that bubble right over here in the corner. So yeah, everything that I, everything that I say about this does not reflect on you because you're in your bubble. 
<laughs> now, now that I got that on my system, bringing him back and having and having it and having him tr and having him try and mentor Spike on paper, not a bad idea. In practice, you have two problems. I'll get to the small one before I get to the big one. The small one is um, him tr is trying to have him be roughly similar to to bu to bulk from the 90s, which it which ignores ignores all of the ignores all of the mountain of growth that he that he had over the over the span of a decade. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you there because they actually didn't do that. Now I will admit they kind of the making him do the comedy shtick wasn't a really the best idea. But at the same time, if you're gonna bring back bulk, that's what you bring bulk back for. Mm -hmm. So you kind of had to avoid. But they still were showing him to be you know he's still back to he's still being a heroic person. He still wants to try to be a hero again, like he did at the end of Countdown to Destruction. So. That wasn't as bad as it could have been. The problems come with uh, probably what else you've got to bring up. And I want to see what you say first before I add it to it, because I might have something to add. Then the bit, but dumb. Now, I, w I, w I will, I will, I will note as, as a quick aside before I get to the bigger one. All this attempt to try and do a one for one recreation and they didn't, cre and they didn't create Michael Brown. Ugh. Richard Brown, yeah. Yeah, Richard, yeah, Brown, Richard but... Brown. I mean, you could have gotten Robert Baldwin. He was willing to do it. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just, say, I'm just saying I'm just saying the the idea is the idea of somebody trying to do the wannabe samurai thing would be what it's it slots itself in way too perfectly. And it's a case it's a case of you've got a golden opportunity to do it and you piss on it. Yeah. You could have a scene where uh, the Rangers need some help. Bulk's doing his training thing. They see him, and like, okay, we can't give you any powers, but if you want to help, but you know, maybe we can cook something up for you. Simple power up of the the suit, the, the the poorly designed Russian Ken Brown suit, and just say, okay, you're the Brown Samurai Ranger for the day, but you can only do it for today. We don't have enough power to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> like, you could have easily written that in, and people would have loved it. Again, to see Bulk as a pseudo ranger for a day? Come on! Not only that, not only that, you could have given Kevin more to because in Shinkendra, that was a fucking Ryu no skate episode. But oh. but um the bigger issue Spike. Just Spike. Oh. Yeah, look, if you're gonna bring back one half of the team. You need to bring in the other half of that team. Bulk does not work without Skull. And trying to put in something similar, trying to bring his quote-unquote son in, ain't gonna cut it. Because, and especially since Spike was just, you know, we complained about Bulk regressing back to how he was in the 90s. No, Spike was Skull in Season 1. That he was. Or a poor man's version therein. Yeah, the, the retarded cousin of of Skull from season one, and, and then to twist the knife further, Skull does show up in the last episode. It's like, oh fuck you! Mm -hmm. But I do want to bring up the other factor with this because it, it's been noted in interviews and such that one of the reasons why Bulk and Spike had some issues was that they were a last minute addition, and it is painfully obvious because that they spend half the season. Never interacting with the Rangers, which only goes to that whole thing of um of the mo the move for the season was very, uh was very slapdash, and I think yeah I think I think you have I think the combination of those kind of things plus want it, wanting to wanting to embrace having a lot of people having their favorite show back after it's after it seemed like it like it would be um done. And let's let's make this clear. While while a lot of pe while a lot of people would have na would have probably migrated over to watching watching the Sentai, um, not as many as you not as many as you'd think would be willing to make that plunge. It's the same reason that um, you can't that um, you're only going to have a small amount of people if you if you say have a wrestling show and an MMA show in the same block. You're only going to have a small amount of crossover between those two audiences. Yeah. 
I mean, Linkara is a perfect example of this. He knows the Sentai exists. He knows, you know, he references it often because it has to, but he has made it clear. He does not give two shits about the Sentai. And you will not be able to convince him otherwise. So trying to bridge that when you it's the bridge does not wish to be built, you're just hurting the people who actually give a shit. Mm-hmm. Now, and this is another thing we got to point out with Jonathan Zacker because... Mm-hmm. While there has been some debate on this, the common consensus is that Zacker is a Sentai fanboy. Oh, we all know how we, and we all know how we feel about fanboys around here, don't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this is something that we've seen from Zacker even prior to the Daniel Saban era, is that he tries his damnedest to bring the Sentai influences into the adaptations, and very rarely does it ever work. The, I'd say I'd say if I could if if there was a perfect analog for his idea of adaptation, even though this is admittedly a far more extreme and far worse um, far far worse case of, case of it, but Gus Van Sant's um, attempt to remake Psycho, the infamous shot for shot remake that got that got a Razzie. That and the, and had Vince Vaughn as Norman Bates. Oh, I yeah, find that, that to be an ideal analog because because of the fact that tr- that um in trying in trying to br- in trying to bring in the so- the source material into a place where a lot a lot of stuff in that source material doesn't fit or does or doesn't fit what what um what the what the adaptation has become because. The thing is, what the thing is, while there are, while there have been parallels over the years, as time has gone on, the Venn diagram between Power Rangers and Super Sentai, that that intersecting part has gotten smaller and smaller with time because they've uh, they've developed their own separate identities. Yeah. Especially when it comes to the um the teasing around of of a sh- of shared universe. That's something that Toei, they've attempted to do so in, in the last few years, especially with the crossover movies. But in t- but on the but on the same on the same tier as as having as as having established areas with their own separate teams. That's not really that's not really something that's a thing. Even when it comes, even when it comes to se- to um to season team ups, yeah, it, <laughs> it's something that Power Rangers is you know some a few times there's been times where a team has been separate from everything else. Usually, it's alternate universes like RPM and another season we'll get to later. But more often than not, they do have this kind of interconnectivity, showing that these teams are still existing. It's just that they are not the main team. It's not their fight anymore. They do the one fight, and that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's to leave it for the next team for them to learn and grow from. We've done our growth. We've reached our peak. We don't need to keep doing this. We if another if an old team shows up, it's to help teach the new team and help them grow. Mm-hmm. And. Beca- and because of that, trying to trying to straight ad- trying to straight adapt without without acknowledge without acknowledging the two different identities, is inevitably going to lead to problems. But like I like I said, I think in the aftermath of Sa- of Samurai, a lot of people were a lot of people had the attitude of, okay, there were some problems, but it's good but it's good to see the gang back together in some form. And they were thinking, okay. They'll, okay, they'll learn from this, and then they'll, and they'll, then they'll get better for next season. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even oh. fucking finish it. Not with a straight face you get, because let's get to the big one. See, we, like we said, with Samurai, they had to rush. They had to rush things because of how quickly they had, how little time they had. But as Linkara put it best, when it came to Mega Force. The kid gloves were off. They had two whole years to prepare for Mega Force and Super Mega Force, mm-hmm. and by all accounts, 
it was even worse. In fact, to give you an idea of how bad it was, I would like all of you watching at home to look at the splash screen that I have lovingly put together, like always. You will notice that aside from uh, one extra team that we'll be talking about briefly later, as far as the main teams of the Neo Saban era, all of them have their helmets off and showing their faces, except for technically one, but it's two because they're separate costumes. That Those two teams that you see without the helmets was one season, and it, it really does exemplify what made this season stick out in the worst way possible. Because every other season, flaws or, all, flaws or not, all of the characters had character. They had a personality. They had their own stories. Mega Force was the most bland, boring, one-dimensional characters I've ever fucking seen in Power Rangers. And I would the I remember when the whole when the whole thing fit when the whole thing um finished, and I had I had said what I'm looking at here is. A car is a cargo cult, a cargo cult who, who, as as Chuck Sonberg has said, thinks that if they imitate the appearance of a runway, the planes will come back. Because you, because yeah. that is what you have through a lot of this—a very pale imitation of what came before. And I think I think for I think first off, we need to address the um, source materials in the in this instance now. Now, um, for the long, with for the longest time, the idea of using most se most seasons have used one series from Super Sentai as their as their resource. In um, Mega Force and Super Mega Force decided to use two in tw in this whole twenty episode interval, which um, there are cer there are certain f there are certain factors when it when it comes to why I could see why this why this was a thing, but this was this was very much Zacker at his at his most um Zacker. Zacker. <laughs> um. Now, in yeah. The <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. But. The two source material. Instead of using just one source material for this for this season, they used two. The first one was Go Sager. The second one was um, was Go Kaiger. Now, those two are a case are a case of a tale of two cities because, as I recall, Go Sager was not received very well, whereas Go Kaiger got crazy popular. Yeah, I would say overly pop, oh, too popular to be honest. But yeah, here's the thing, and, and not just in terms of popularity, but also in terms of aesthetic, motif, everything. Now, to be fair, Power Rangers did do decently in terms of using some of the aesthetics of make of Ghost Sager because, you know, you, it's an anniversary season. That was the big draw of Mega Force was it was the 20th anniversary of Power Rangers. It was celebrating. All of the history of Power Rangers in this season. And this is why they had to use two so two sets of Sentai, because they needed to bum rush their way through one, again, thanks to that whole Toei contract, to get to the anniversary stuff with Go Kaiger. They needed to get to that footage ASAP, but they had to use Go Sager first. So they decided to just smash the two together, each series being done in half a season, to just get to the good stuff this backfired hard part of part of the issue is the is the fact that like the reason why you the reason why i use the tale of two cities analog is you have is you have two that you have two that could not be them thematically more apart and it's while you don't have the while you don't have the cultural issue as you did before that is something that you do ha that you do have to address since go sager you have the you had them as angels and you have very ornate designs you have the whole thing with the with um the tiki head and the and the cards whereas go kaiger you have pirates doing pirate things with pirate weapons yeah. 
And this is where I'm going to call out Link. You know, I've been, I've been bringing up Linkara a lot because his history of Power Rangers is a very good resource for a lot of information. Mm -hmm. But this is the one time I'm going to call his ass out. Because I got to vehemently disagree with something he said in regards to the Go Kaiger footage in, my, th in Super Mega Force. I think I know where this is going. <laughs> I'm mind sure if, you do. Mind if I take mind if I take a shot in the dark on this? Go for it. Is it uh, is it over him him sit him sit him saying that that um that there that that there was that there was no need for them to for them to acknowledge the pirateness of Go Kaiger. You are on the fucking money, sir. <laughs> now, let me explain my argument to this because I I don't want to be mean. I see where Linkar is coming from, in that he, the argument he made is that other seasons that have had a motif didn't go all in on that motif. His reference was, as we mentioned earlier, Hurricane Jir and Ninja Storm, where they had the ancient ninja electric guitar, which, by the way, dude, Lewis, that is a weak fucking argument, because <laughs> here's the thing. While, yes, there are aspects of... Uh, of the motif that were tweaked in other seasons. Men you know, you look at Ninja Storm, that season still was centered around the ninja motif. They had a ninja training academy. They used ninja moves even outside the suits. Mm -hmm. Everything was centered around the ninja thing. Hell, the villain was a, dis was a ninja who was exiled for being a dumbass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, for being... But... Here, you have pirate suits. You have pirates-based weapons with a freaking cutlass and a uh, what's the type of gun they were using? Um, it's not. It's not a. It's not a um, flintlock. A flintlock, flintlock pistol yeah, with a flintlock and a cutlass. Mm -hmm. Their zor Their main zord is a fucking pirate ship. Everything about that motif screamed pirates. You can't put that there. Without at least acknowledging that. You know, that's where I say I call bullshit on this argument. And this is the one time where, no, you had to acknowledge it. You could get away with not acknowledging the angel motif in, Me in Megaforce because nothing about the about the rest of the, you know, the, the suits don't scream angel right away. They don't have wings everywhere. You could easily edit around that. There was, the Zords didn't have any kind of heavenly motif. So you didn't have to bring up anything about angels and Megaforce. But when you got to Super Megaforce and you see all of that pirate motif sticking out like a sore fucking thumb, you kind of have to point it out. Not only that, the helmets for the suits are themed after pirate hats. It, it's got pirate symbols all over the place. How their morpher is a skull and crossbones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't ignore that. This is, I know I, I know it gets repetitive with me using the phrase elephant in the room, but the reason I keep using that is A, it works, and two, and B, um, elephants are big and hard to ignore. And this is a case of something that is impo impossible to ignore, like a, like a elephant crashing on your couch. Yeah. Well, what well, was so, your couch? Because it's not because it's not there anymore. Yeah, that's why a lot of people complained about that. You know, there were some complaints that I will agree weren't necessarily. You know, I even I complained about the whole fact that they had the name Ghost Sager, uh, Ghost Sager on the on the cards when they used the Zords. Okay, yeah, minor nitpick, something that you could uh, understandable why they couldn't edit around that. It would have been a pain in the ass. I mm -hmm. forgive that. What I do, but the pirate thing, no, I do not. I don't forgive that. That was a dumb mistake. And I also know why they did do it, why they didn't acknowledge it, because they needed to focus on the anniversary aspect more than the pirate aspect. It's just a case of you could have done both, but you were too folk. But Zacker was too focused on other things he wanted to bring over from the Sentai, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this is <laughs> we have to address because we, there, there's two big elephants, two other big elephants in the room. One, in Mega, in the first half in Mega Force, the fact that you had to rush through three different villain factions in 20 episodes. Because you had the War Star Army, you had the mutants, and then you had the robots. Mm -hmm. And you try to squeeze that into 20 episodes? Hell, you had to save the final villain arc for the second half. 
because of how squished this was. And the th now the, the whole that whole that whole three that whole three factions thing. Um, multiple factions had been teased about in the past, but the but um the last time we the last time we had that kind of thing was Bokenger slash Operation Overdrive. Um, and it what and whether or not whether or not it worked all that well in Bokenger is subject to debate. Mm. But we'll we'll we'll, prob we'll probably end up tackling that late later down the line. But generally speaking, it's not something that's been dipped into, and there's a there, I'd say there's a good reason for that. The issue the issue, no matter how many episodes you have, is time. When you have. You can kind of get away with that when you've got, say, 45 to 50 episodes to work with. When you've only got 20 episodes to work with, you can't really. No. 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 So, that, that was mistake number one. Now, for the bigger problem. The one that encompassed pretty much the entire C series altogether, but really got noticeable during Super Mega Force. Mm-hmm. As Linkara put it best, the bizarre form of laziness when it came to the production of this show. Editing things out that didn't need to be edited out. Editing things in that didn't need to be in. New powers! Oh, there it is! That's the big one. You know, in my line of work, there is a, there is a, um, ter there is a term called the, called the Monty Hall GM. Um, Hall being H A U L. It's basically a play. It's basically a play on uh, Monty Hall, the original host of Let's Make a Deal. A Monty mm -hmm. Hall GM is somebody who is very, very generous when it comes to handing out XP, when it comes to handing out gear, when it comes to handing out treasure, and so on. And it's generally speaking something that you don't want to do because you're, because in doing so you end up making things. A little bit too easy, or you, or you're not putting enough um, threat for your players. There is a ridiculous amount of this Monty Hall thing with the with um, what I call the new power drinking game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm gonna save us a lot of headaches here. There is a reason that we have this button when it comes to our quote unquote. Can you even really call them a mentor? <laughs> that is a that is a debatable affair. But yeah, there's a reason why we have this button. There's a simple explanation for that. <laughs> I'll... God damn it, go say. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not going to play the whole button here, but yeah. Gosei was, in all intent, in all facets, simply a gotcha machine in Power Rangers form. Because yeah. the frequency of him handing out new powers and abilities with no reason whatsoever was so excessive it was embarrassing. Like, they literally would just ask for a new power, and he would give it to them! But What's the worse... Go ahead, go, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Flutter. What's worse is that, A, in in Super Mega Force, he's extremely shoehorned in, because Gokaidra... The Gokaidra's never had a mentor. And, B, these... the. The keys that they get him, they feel extremely unearned. Unlike in Gokaiger, they're actually they're actually earned by by the uh, returning senshi that show up in certain episodes. Like the grand powers in Gokaiger was one of the big aspects of the story that they would need to gain the grand powers of all of the all the past Sentai teams in order to unlock the ultimate treasure. That was the whole crux of the story. Now, obviously, you're not going to be doing that here, since we've already established they don't use the pirate motif, so they wouldn't be treasure hunting. But you could have still done something similar. Instead, no, it's literally just handing them out. And then, talking about new powers, 
powers never before seen on this planet. <laughs> now, <laughs> you could have done this better. You could have done this properly with introducing powers, uh, introducing Sentai-only powers. Die Ranger and some of the pre-Zoo Ranger teams. Mm -hmm. You could have easily done this. But, my God, did they clear... Somebody in production just did not care about establishing anything. They just want to... This is where I think Zachary's fanboyism is very noticeable because he just wanted to stick these teams in so that they could burn through the footage and did not care how they were utilized. Mm -hmm. And for some re for some reason, oh, for some reason, the one that got the most that got the most focus in this was Die Ranger. Which don't get me wrong, I like I like Die Ranger, and it's had it's had some of my favorite suit designs. But at the at the same time, you have the the ex the explanation given is ju is just is, is just they've never they've never before been seen. Let's all let's all. <laughs> Let's also not let's put us let's put aside the fact that um, given the fact that the sixth that um the sixth ranger analog in Die Ranger was Kiba Ranger, which would be used for the which would be used for the White Tiger, in um, in MMPR. You have once again you have a golden opportunity just sitting right on your right on your lap to to expand the world. Because. It's already it's already known that he didn't that he didn't that the big Z didn't find the coins originally. He he or rather he found the coins. He didn't make them. So you could just as easily go that that even the even the even the new suit that they made was um but was built was built on an ancient template. Yeah. I just pulled that you out of my ass and that's and that's still more <laughs> effort. <laughs> that, that that shows you the amount of work that these guys did on, like, how much effort they put into actually writing any kind of story. It, this was a, like, the reason why I pointed out the lack of faces on the splash screen was that this was not a series about characters. This was not a series about a story. This was an action series. Pure action. What, I'd, what I'd like to, what I, the analog that I'd like to use when it comes to this is that. This is this is what this is what um this is what a lot of cynics straw man shows like this into being. And I'm put I'm throwing Transformers into the, into this bubble as well. They look at they we've seen we've seen this kind of smug dismissal of it being just an advertisement for toys. Um this is the one season where that that particular straw man argument actually applies for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, because mm -hmm. when you look at the characters our rangers in this season, how much development did they ever actually have? The you can't even really say anything about Jake and Gia's relationship because it literally yeah, it really was just Jake pining over her the entire time, and then she gives him a light little peck on the cheek at the last second. That was the extent of their relationship. <sighs> Hell, the fucking robot had more development than the actual cast. Let, although, um... We... At the very least, we got some good memes out... We got some good memes out of that. For, for one, um... Making it, making him, making him act like a act like a robot gave us put gave us plenty of opportunities to make RoboCop jokes at his expense. <laughs> that voice, yeah, it was almost inevitable there. Um, two, during the whole having during the whole Robo Knight turning heel thing, we got possibly the greatest bit of um of I am acting moments that we'll ever see. The most emotion Troy ever shows in the entire series. <laughs> Now and 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 this is where the Sentai peril came because that was basically just them copying the Sentai. Or that was the one big, the huge bit of cut, copy and paste because it was literally supposed to be just Alita tapping into his powers as an angel to free the free um, 
go say night. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. here, it's just literally suddenly Troy can go Super Saiyan. The fuck? <laughs> like, which yes, I ha which yes, you could you can bring up the whole argument of him being of him originally being tied to the morphing grid into this. But even then, it's a it's a it's a weak argument because they do absolutely fucking nothing with that idea. They never even explained that. It was never even hinted at that he had any kind of connection. And no, those fucking dreams don't count. No. All right? You have to establish that he has some kind of actual connection to the grid. Which, yeah. Uh, uh, how do you have an anniversary series that celebrates the entire franchise and not mention how they uh, the morphing grid? Because how else could they use the fucking keys? Exactly. Now... When it comes now, over when it comes to when it, when it comes to again, there's that there's that half in half out late laziness where they where they put effort into the wrong things, and in some this and one one particular adage that I seem to be using a lot that ends up applying here is children study tactics, men study logistics. It's very easy. To have a to have a lot of past um, actors cameo when all the actors are relatively in the same country, but when you're when, but ev but ever since um ever ever since they ever since a little ways into ever since the end of um Wild Force, the in order to cut on costs, the filming had moved over to New Zealand. And, but at the same time, a lot of former actors were it were in the states, and of course, you also have the um, the awkwardness that it that is the relationship with unions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and a lot and a lot of former actors had would have union status, which um, people people who actors who actors who have SAG generally don't generally don't feel like working with the equivalent of. Um, outlaw people. Yeah, there's a re it's a reason why only only in this recent season of Dino Fury have we finally seen SAG actors showing up because Hasbro actually gives a shit and will actually pay will actually go through the trouble of getting SAG actors. Mm -hmm. But Saban was notorious for not wanting to work with SAG because he wanted to be as cheap as he could possibly get away with. Yeah, and. When it com when it comes to, and th this and even with even if that wasn't a factor, you also have the you also have the whole thing of the logistical issue of trying to br of trying to bring in people all the way from the states to do what's effectively glorified cameos for a weekend, while fl while and and flying them all the way from the st from the states to um, New Zealand. That flight ain't cheap. No. no. What is Especially it? for as many people as they needed to bring in, and on top of that, apparently, from what was been said, that whole bringing in past actors was a last-minute addition as well. Which, <clears throat> considering they were already hyping up the anniversary, makes you scratch your head and wonder why didn't you plan for that from the start? Especially since one, everybody everybody knew about that massive battle when that when that thing was circulating social media for months. And two, you show footage of it in the first damn episode. Yeah, you're basically you're, you're basically telegraphing that this was going to happen. You should have been prepared for that. I mean, we didn't expect you to get everybody. We figured there were going to be some people who turned it down, people who were busy, people you know, or that you know budget was going to be a little tight and you wouldn't be able to get everybody. We we would have forgiven that. Mm -hmm. No, you decided to wait till the last minute so that the actors. Could not plan for that. Like, I think they only had like a couple of months before the filming. Mm -hmm. And most actors book way in advance for shit like this. <clears throat> oh, I'm, I just do interviews, and I are, and I, and I am no, I'm no different when it comes to booking in advance. Yeah. So to think that you, the only, the only actor who you would have had readily available. Which, no surprise, was actually in the show, was Jaden, was Alex Hartman, because, well, he would have just come off filming that. They would have like, hey, can you stick around and just fill a couple scenes for us? Mm -hmm. 
You know, not that hard to do. And that, and of course, um, Casey's actor from um, Jungle Fury. Jungle Fury. Because he was a writer on the show, so of course he was there to help out. You yeah. know, that episode wouldn't have happened if he hadn't if he hadn't been a writer. <laughs> <laughs> but but other than that, like everybody else, wait until the last minute and then only be able to get like not even a quarter of the actors, like a tenth. Yeah. It's basically the equivalent of te- the, the equivalent of telling uh, the actors that showed up in one ninety nine they only had two months of film. Ugh. And the thing is, the thing is, when you ha- when this is this is the reason why um why pl- why plan why planning this kind of why planning this kind of thing should have been done. I I'd, I'd argue that they should that they should have planned for this um right right um half halfway through half halfway through halfway through Samurai they should have been pl- they should have been planning for what they were going to do with it, with yeah. the anniversary, but. There, but um, but for what, but for whatever reason, that that wasn't that wasn't the case, and I do feel I do feel bad for a lot of the actors who tr- who tried to, who tried to make it work, and especially um, especially tr- especially Troy's actor because it because a lot because a lot of people had this idea of him being very very stiff when you see him in interviews and he's j- and he's a lot more regular. Yeah. That that that's a problem we saw from a lot of the cast on both Samurai and Mega Force is that it became very clear as time went on that honestly the actors were not the problem. I mean, there was a couple of them that yeah, like I'm gonna go ahead and say it, Najita Tej, yeah, not the greatest of actors. I'll straight up say it. I mean, he's a good guy. I have nothing to bad to say about him personally, but it was not good. But like everyone in Mega Force, mm-hmm. and you know. At all, even even Chris, even Chris Hour, who did the voice of Robo Knight, was just again that was at least funny in its delivery. But everybody else, Andrew Gray, John Lark, John Mark Laddermilk, Tierra Hanna, Azim Rizk, Christina Masterson, Cameron Jibo, all of them are like you could tell they wanted to put in their best. And if there's anyone I really feel sorry for aside from Andrew Gray, it's fucking Azim, man. He got yeah. the shaft. When it came to Super Mega Force, because that button I played earlier, that was about that was in re- that was in response Gosei's response to uh, Jake, Azim's character, asking why his color went from black to green. Why and is my that- green? And that was the explanation. It was literally yeah, Gosei saying that, and then suddenly the attack. As I as I understand it, that was put in as a the um that was put in because they because they thought it was they thought that thing was funny. Yes, I actually asked Azim about this personally when I interviewed him years ago, and he straight up said he literally went up to the producers with a whole list of ideas of how to handle the scene, and they literally told him, "Nope, we're doing it this way because it's gonna be fucking funny." That sounds like a that sounds like something I'd ex- I'd expect to hear out of um out of the writers room the writers room in WWE. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you know, like, tr- you that- know, focus more on pop- focus more on popping the guys in the back than the- than the people inside the that than the people who are going to be watching. Yeah, that was I think that's when everyone realized that this show was uh, doomed to fail because. Mm-hmm. That, like if they're not even willing to even put an effort into something like that, what made anybody think they were gonna do anything for the rest of this series? And I will not say that Mega Force and Super Mega Force are the worst seasons of Power Rangers. No, Overdrive still holds that distinction by a country fucking mile. Mm-hmm. But if there is something we can definitely say about Mega Force, it is the most disappointing season of the franchise. Because of how much they hyped it. Not just how much it was already hyped on its own being an anniversary, but how much Saban and Bandai hyped the shit out of it. Only for us to get this. And I think it I think in the aftermath of, of the affair, a lot a lot there were a lot of I feel there were a lot of questions being asked behind the scenes. And a lot and a lot of a lot of um reevaluation of things. 
because I go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. Uh, I think with the way Zacker was literally spending as much as he did on this series and all the especially with the marketing of it, and then it for it to be this big of a disaster, that kind of wasted money. Even so, Bond had to go. What the fuck are you doing? And to be to be quite honest, um, I wasn't surprised when I when I found out that he was when I found out that he was um not that he was not going to be involved anymore. Um, but I'm <laughs> I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that if that if he had stuck around, um, there may have been a walkout. Yeah. Because I think even a lot, because I think a lot of the writers and other producers were like, "Dude, you fucked it up. We are not working with you anymore." Mm -hmm. Thankfully, even Saban knew better, and I'm willing to bet that a lot of people complained to Saban to let him know that, yeah, this is what your guys doing. Like all of that combined would have been like, okay, that's it, Zachary, get the fuck out. Because the next season that comes up, we get somebody who actually knows what the fuck they're doing in the form of Judd. Chip Lynn. Although I will, I will note when I when I saw when I, looking back there is um there is one there is one there is one line from Endgame that um perfect that perfectly sum that perfectly summarizes this because I have I sometimes have to wonder if there is a bar somewhere where Judd Lynn and Naruhisa Arakawa go to vent their frustrations with the people that they have to work for. <laughs> <laughs> because because both of them seem both of them seem to have the same issue. They ended up writing the they ended up writing the book on how to do a se a season for their respective shows, and yet and yet when they're when they're when they're um when they're not brought back, and that and and then the shows end up end up doing worse. They end up pull they end up pulling an audible and calling them back. And I the I want I want to do a meme of 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 of. Of Judd Lynn just going, you could not live with your failure, and where did that bring you? Back to me. Because <laughs> yeah, you look at the best seasons of Power Rangers, you know, in space, Time Force, RPM, amongst others. Judd's name is right at the top of all of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so it was no surprise, and it was actually quite exciting to hear that he would come back for the next season for Power Rangers Dino Charge, which is a which is a, is a bit of um is a bit of a full circle ness for us because as some of you as some of you may recall um the source material for Dino Charge we've ta we've talked about a long time ago when we did our tribute episode. To Riku Sanjo, since th since this was, I believe the, I believe the only time that he that he that he was sh that he was show running a Super Sentai work, and given everything yes, that happened, given everything that happened, he's not go he's not going back to that. Because <laughs> while he, while um while I'd say I'd say Kyoto Yuger was a was a success, um. There were a lot of there were a lot of cases of Toei dicking him about to the yeah, point to the point where he was at to, active war with them. <laughs> yeah, forcing him to work with a large cast, forcing him to do, make, do a lot of changes. Hell, one producer not even allowing the idea of a yellow ranger because they thought the yellow ranger was too girl was a girly color. When if you look at Sentai's history, uh, no, that is. Not even close. Have there been Yellow Rangers in the past? Yes. Well, fem female Yellow Rangers, I should say, in um, Sentai. Yes, that is true. But they're in the minority. So, yeah. This led a lot of people to believe that this producer, whoever, I don't know who it was specifically, was likely somebody who was watching more Power Rangers than Sentai. We do know that we do know that there had been t that there had been that um there had been a lot of back and forth back and forth and back adaptation of of material and I'm not I'm not gonna say that it's that that's what happened I'm just gonna say that if it did I'd be willing to believe it 
Yeah. Though, it's funny, we mentioned how, you know, Riku Sanjo had problems with Toei dicking him around. This is where we have to stop looking at the head, the head showrunner for problems when it came to Power Rangers. But instead, we're going to have to look elsewhere. But I'm going to save that for the end because we need to really break down what the problems were before we actually explain where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Because Dino Charge, for the most part, is often... I would say the consensus for most people is that Dino Charge was the best season of the Neo Saban era. Not saying it's a great season. It has plenty of problems, but it was the one that felt the most competently designed. And when it... A lot, and um, I'd say I'd say a lot I'd say a lot of that has to, has to do with the fact that the, that one you had somebody who knew what he was doing with this kind, with this kind of thing, and two, you ha you um, you had you had a gr you had a group of people who you had a group of people who um, who, under who understood what they were working with and tr and tried their tried their best when it came to when it came to tr when it came to adapt when it came to adapting a a large cast it wasn't completely successful but the but there was clear f there was clear effort um i do think i do think that on i do think that on it is tempting for us to say that possibly the reason that people were lighter on dino charge was because of how grandfathered in three, um, three straight seasons, three, um, two full-on series of dis of disappointment. But I don't, I don't really think that's the case. I think it, I think there if Dino, I think if Dino Charge had come first, it still, w it still would have been well received. It's a case of yeah, sure. There was probably some people just happy to know that there was somebody in charge that knew what the hell they were doing, mm -hmm. and that probably made things a little easier for them to digest. But there was actually a lot to legitimately like about Dino Charge. There, you know, the characters were solid. Everyone felt, you know, everyone felt like they had a character. You know, Tyler was a guy searching for his father and understanding what happened. You have Chase the. The, the, the slacker who just, you know, has his own way of doing things. You've got Coda, the fucking caveman, who's a freaking awesome dude, especially when he's played by a guy who's a also a Power Rangers and Zentai fan. Mm -hmm. I'm not calling him a fanboy because he's one of the good ones. You've got Riley, who was, you know, he was a guy who wanted to break away from being a farm boy and do something different. You had Shelby, who's in a similar vein, you know, has the intelligence to do something great, but has been, you know, pushed to push down for one reason or another like they didn't go with the race angle but you could clearly see a, like a subtext there going on with that mm -hmm. you know and then even with kendall you know a, a, a someone who has who understands what's going on who almost thinks too highly of themselves at first until they were kind of knocked down a peg you know even even the even the lesser characters had moments hell fucking prince philip Mm -hmm. A tertiary character had a couple had a moment where he got to show, hey, you know, being a hero actually does some good. And th now, gr now granted, now granted, the introduction of of Keeper and having and having your and having your big bads be um be a be a quote unquote power couple, um. I would I would say I would say that the that there there is there is one particular avenue that they brought in that is that was possibly the be, possibly the best addition, and that is well our first our first instance of a villain who's a who, who's had a Jekyll and Hyde complex since the days of Dino Thunder, and how fitting since his name the names of his two personalities were Heckle and Snide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, that was the best. Like that, I think that's what really made it work. Was yeah. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but for the most part, Heckle was a trip. Hell, we called him the Tith Lord. He was part Time Lord, part Sith Lord because of just how you know crazy, fun, over the top, and just sinister he could be at times up until a certain point. Yeah, and. 
I'd say, now I'd now when it came to the introduction of the Energem thing, it was it it didn't t it it was a case of it was a case of window dressing for me. Like it didn't t it didn't take away too much, but it did but it wasn't a deal breaker to a point. And unfortunately, if we're going to be talking about something like Dino Charge, we can't do that without discussing the ending. Oh, yeah, this is where the series kind of like it, it's a case. It, I, I, I equate it to a line by Jim Carrey in Batman Forever. Ooh, nice form. A little rough on the landing. They may have to settle for the bronze. Uh, putting putting aside the fact that you have um, you have the whole notion of the Earth being being sentenced to the black hole, <laughs> but then reveal then revealing that the combined gems can time travel, and you and using that to stop the problem before it starts, but in the process of doing that, creating so many problems. And as I've mentioned before, this is the reason why I always exercise extreme caution to. Anyone, anyone, doing a time travel story because time travel is a fucking minefield. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this didn't just have problems for this season. This the problems that Dino Charge's ending had was felt through the next two seasons straight. Because in do in doing that, they effectively stop. They effectively stopped the the whole the extinction of the dinosaurs as it was known in history and thus you have dinosaurs in present day and there and the amount of questions that that just raises like how are they going to feed how are they going to feed them why are t-rexes not rampaging through si through cities what why how do you manage how do you manage to deal with the with um the giant piles of shit as we learn as we learned from Jurassic Park how, how are <laughs> you going to how are you going to have the, are you going to have very territorial kind of dinosaurs li living alongside everyone else? Oh no! Yeah, I've gone. I... Why does everything taste like copper? <laughs> oh god! I've gone cross-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it, 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 it. You know, again, going back to Batman Forever, it just raises too many questions. <laughs> and I want to make something clear. If the um, I can count on my hand the number of t the number of stories. That have used time travel, and and did not and had the least amount of holes in the story. Even even stories that I otherwise like have problems. Like as much as I love Back to the Future, its time travel has problems. As much as I love Terminator, its time travel definitely has problems. As much as I <laughs> like Doctor Who, you don't even want to get me started on that because we'll be here for the next five fucking years. <laughs> as, <laughs> the the last story that I came across that managed to handle time travel decently well was an independent film called Primer, which came out in 2004. The, and, the, and while that certainly had its, that certainly had a different set of problems, namely being a little bit technical, it was trying to be the most grounded method of time travel, but the fact that I have to have the fact that there is a visual diagram of how its time travel works on it on the on that movie's Wikipedia page should speak volumes. Yeah, it, it just every and this yeah, and when I say that the, this the, the the ending of Dino Charge had problems for the next two seasons, I'm not just talking about that aspect. I'm also talking about the crossovers that came in the next two seasons because how it, of how they had to explain how the villains kept showing up when they were supposed to be wiped from existence. You know, at the very at the very least with the Z wave, you can make the argument of it of um it took it took out a lot of villains, but it didn't take but it can't take out all of them. Nothing's that thorough. Yeah. You can make arguments for that, but you can't like the, the the explanation was is that the, the the that Sledge and his crew showing up in the next season was because it was the crew that got sucked through the black hole from the list from this season, not the one that was wiped it thrown into the sun at the end of the series. Mm -hmm. And are there are there ways to work around this issue? Yes, but at the at the same time, you've got you've. 
it's one it's one of those things where you ha you ha there's a lot that you have to work there's a lot there's a lot of bullshit that you have to sweep up but like i said that was the peak and it seemed it seemed like things were starting to get better and then we get to the what i could what i would consider the ghost of this era i say go i say ghost because it kind of came and went and did, and wasn't even all that memorable and that is ninja steel now you would i will i will admit my even for one you ha this was always get this was going to be an uphill battle since you since this was adapting shuriken sentai nin ninja one of the worst sentai entries in the last 10 years 10 years i'd say it's one of the worst entries period the only reason the only reason i have to do that is because i haven't i haven't seen enough um enough showa era sentai to make to cast judgment from all accounts i'd say its closest competitor would probably be five man but even then like that still probably would have been better than what this what Ninja gave us but that's beside the point the point is, like you said, they had to adapt that into a decent Power Ranger season. Chiplin is a good writer. He is not a fucking miracle worker. Now, the the whole Galaxy Warriors thing, I get, I guess was a, I would say was a cute idea, but the one of the, I'd say one of the big, one of the big problems is, is um, you know how you know how we talked about that about that whole issue you had with. Linkara's sent sentiment during Megaforce. Yeah. This com this is where this is where that kind of thing comes back comes back to bite because there is very little ninja in this in this ninja in this ninja season. Yeah, though they did try. Like they had them wear ninja outfits, they used the ninja power stars. Mm -hmm. Like there was some aspect of those things, but they didn't exactly steep everything in full ninja mythos and i'm not i'm not expecting them to to go all in on um on mythos but as i mentioned before there it, there was a cultural zeitgeist in the states with the ninja craze in the 80s so, and with that brings certain expectations and those are expectations that you can't that you cannot work around there is a, there is a pop there is a pop culture idea in people's heads about about ninja characters and you have absolutely none of you have absolutely none of that you could slot in any any power set in um, ninja steel and you wouldn't have to change all that much to be fair to to be fair to ninja steel part of the problem is going back to the sentai because Nin the Ninjas were the most anti-ninja ninjas in existence. Yeah, the whole. Uh, I want I want to make clear that that in the ba in the backlog I do have um, Nin Ninja as a as a potential reconstruction. It's not going to happen. I can promise you that it is not going to happen in 2021. It will inevitably happen. It's just a matter of the, um the right time. Yeah. But the the point uh, the thing I'm getting at is that here when when the catchphrase of the ninjas is, is that we are we are ninja but we do not hide that should tell you everything you need to know about why Ninja Steel couldn't really do the whole ninja thing that deep. Let's not forget that that got roasted over an open flame during that during the Ninja Sentai crossover. Yeah, and yet they tried to make it look like the ninjas were the right were in the right on that one. Because that's a whole host of problems that we talked about in a previous Geek Watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the, that just meant that these guys really couldn't go super ninja with Ninja Steel. It kind of broke. They kind of had. They kind of got themselves written in a corner that they uh, not by their own choice. Yeah. If and to be to be quite honest, if there's if there's an, if there's anybody I f if there's anybody I feel bad for, it's um. It's the guy. It's oddly enough the guy. The guy. I, the guy I spent about a year picking on. <laughs> that be that being that being Peter. That being um the Sidarsos. Yeah. 
it, honestly, the one of the one of the few good things about the about Ninja Steel was that moment at the announcement at mm-hmm. Power Morphicon, where Yoshi Sidarso had no idea that his brother was going to be cast as the as the Blue Ninja Steel Ranger. And that moment where he opens the envelope, sees his brother's name, and busts into tears was a heartfelt moment that you have to see for yourself. Like, that yep. was freaking amazing. Um, and the, the, whole, the whole thing with his character ha- having a, magi- having a um, stage magician kind of gimmick is something that's oddly fitting. That was obviously their attempt to incorporate the fact that uh, Nin, Nin in Blue was... A, or Ao Ninja was using magic because he went to a magic school. So they tried to kind of incorporate that, and it worked. For the most part, I'd say it worked. Mm-hmm. It's not perfect, but it worked. And there was, you know, again, there are some things about Ninja Steel that were actually pretty interesting. The relationship between Calvin and Haley didn't really go anywhere with it, and I wish they had kept the kissing scene in. But they at least made efforts with it. Mm-hmm. Having Sarah being a tech genius was really cool. The story arc with uh, Brody and Levi was actually pretty well handled. Admittedly, the story about Dane Romero could have been done better, but eh, what are you going to do? Hell, even Mick Canick had, had his moments. But again, again, how do you go wrong with Kelson fucking Henderson? Yeah, but there is, there is, one, there is one very significant misstep that I... Um, I suspect was not a I suspect was not a Chip Lynn call. And that is um that is Victor and Monty. I had a feeling that's where we were going with this. Yeah. You may, you may recall if you may recall a few years ago I did I did it I submitted a meme to Toku memes of them in the trash can saying Victor and Monty in their natural habitat. <sighs> now on the surface Victor and Monty made perfect sense. They were supposed to be the bulk and skull for the season. A comic relief duo who picked on the Rangers only to get their comeuppance in the end. Mm -hmm. But the problem was, was that it was way too excessive and over the top with how they handled things. Some of the jokes just were felt so forced. It was unbearable. And, then they gave them their shining moment of glory at the end of the first half involving flatulence. And if that wasn't bad enough, they start the next season with them trying to bottle and sell their flatulence as an anti-monster spray. That pretty much killed any hope of Victor and Monty ever being taken seriously as characters. Mm-hmm. And I'd would say I'd say some I'd say something else that certainly that certainly didn't that certainly didn't help is the fact that for whatever reason it very much felt it very much felt like with this with this particular run that um Chip Lynn kind of checked out and that's that's ultimately the problem that's ultimately the major problem I had with Ninja Steel it was it was not I will say that it was not bad but it was not memorable. No. And, and Gordon knows every again. Everyone on the staff tried. Hell, it's now been well documented that uh, Caleb Bendon, who played Monty, actually was trying to make it so that he had uh, LGBT feeling. He he was having supposed to be ha- trying to like play it off as he was actually gay for Victor. But of course, they couldn't do that in the show because kids show, and you know how parent groups would have gotten him over the shit like that. But. God knows he tried to imply it. <laughs> like, if 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 it hadn't been outright, even though it was an outright spooky, you could just tell. You could tell. And I thought that was a really, I thought it was well handled in that regard. At least they, at least they tried. At least they gave him something to work with. But as you said, this is where I finally reveal what I was talking about earlier when it comes to the fact that there, the, a lot of the issues with both this and Dino Charge. There's another. There is one other name that we have not brought up this entire time, that was likely more of a defining factor about the Neo Saban run more than anything else, even more than Zacker, and that is Heim Saban himself. Mm-hmm. 
because it has been it was actually something we we were talk we actually discussed during Ninja Steel's run when we were re reviewing this on the recap on the Ranger recap is that at first we were blaming everyone. We you know people were blaming Chip, but we knew better. We were blaming the other writers involved, Becca Barnes and Alwyn Dale, thinking they were the ones that were writing all this shit. But that by the end near the end of the season, we started to hear that no, the real problem was from Saban himself as he was apparently sending mandates to the staff to have things be a certain way. Victor and Monty's antics, all of them, Saban's doing. He wanted that shit because he, well, again, we go back to that whole recapturing the zeitgeist aspect. Like I said, Victor and Monty were supposed to be the bulk and skull. That was what Saban wanted. He wanted a new bulk and skull for this generation. And since bringing bulk back directly didn't work very well, he wanted to create a new one. And it also backfired. If there's... I would I would say if there's any analog I can, I can use when it comes to his mindset, it would be... The mindset that um, Gene Roddenberry had in his in his in his brief time as showrunner for Star Trek: The Next Generation, because his his mind his mind and I'm specifically referring to the first two seasons, the see the seasons that even even the diehards of TNG don't want to talk about. <laughs> the season that had one episode that was so bad it got it got the Christmas treatment from Chuck. <laughs> he had he had this he had this mindset, especially especially after after his um disagreements with the with with Starfleet having more military aspects in the films. Is that he was is that he was going to present Star Trek as it was truly meant to be. The pro the problem with that is is that he was he was still in the minds he was still very much in the mindset of season one TOS, and it's argued that he never that he didn't fully understand what exactly made his own his own property work. He thought it, he clearly thought it was it was his particular brand of idealism, which. That was cer that was certainly a factor, but he ended up pushing that so hard in those first two seasons that it became a farce, and I think that's the reason why a lot of people tried to tried tried to I'd say deconstruct and ex and explore aspects of it that he was unwilling to do. And to go to um to put a case in point when it comes to how when it comes to his attitude about things, he um episodes like Family. That focused on in, that focused on say Picard's internal conflict with his family. He hated it. He absolutely despised that episode. Despite the despite the fact that things like family and the inner light um, were what were getting were what were getting awards and getting recognition. But Gene was too. But Gene was very stuck in his is stuck in his ways, and I think I think um I think that's the reason why he ended up getting less and less power as time. Went on and tried to disavow what ca what came after um, TOS, especially the, the whole the whole military thing was a sticking point for him. Even though, as Chuck has pointed out, you have naval ranks in a naval hierarchy. You're on a ship. That ship has weapons. You have or you have orders to follow from from the chain of command. If you do not follow those orders, you can be court-martialed, a term that means military court. But you're not a military. Yeah, you kind of wrote yourself into the corner on that one. And when it comes to when it comes when it comes to my assessment of Haim Saban, he is he is somebody who the idea of the idea of wanting to do a throwback to the pa to the past is an admirable one on paper, but I don't think he ever fully understood what it what it was that made his that made his show that made the show popular. Because what did wasn't the things in se in season one. It was when it was starting to establish its own identity. That's why I brought that kind of thing up um, earlier in this broadcast. Yeah, I I, it, I think what it is is that yeah, it was during the season one where it had the monumental, phenomenal moment where you know that whole one press meeting 
so packed with people that it literally blocked up the highways. Like, that's what he wants to get back to. But what Saban never understood is that you will never get back to that moment. No one is ever going to treat Power Rangers on that level again. That was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And trying to get back to that is is just going to lead to failure. Mm-hmm. You have to just keep... You cannot go backwards. You know, we brought up wrestling earlier... It's the idea. It's the same as other federation, other uh, feds coming up, wanting to go back to the way wrestling used to be. Life doesn't work that way. You will not get popular going back to a time that nobody wants anymore. You have to keep moving forward. You can learn from the past, but that's the thing. You have to learn and use it to make to make a new future. That's how this works. You can have a call back here if it's done well. Mm-hmm. You know. And we see that, we saw that in Beast Warfers. It had its problems, but when it did its callbacks, it did it with a purpose, and it did it right. Yes. And, and, um, what I do, what I, what I do find especially telling is, um, is the, is the fact that around, around the, around the time of, around the time that, around the time that Ninja Steel was coming about, the uh, the conversation in the f- it, within the fan base, not fandom. We've made we've made that clear, but in the fan base, was not so much on the show itself, but on what would have be- what would have otherwise be considered tertiary properties. And I want to get to the weak link in that first, and that being the movie, or or what or what happens when somebody decides to um size to smash together Power Rangers and the Breakfast Club cuz that's basically <laughs> what it was <laughs> You're not wrong. You're not fucking wrong. Now, no. when it came to that movie, I will admit I was extremely hesitant because the last two attempts at doing a movie haven't exactly panned out. And the f- and the fact that the the suit des- the suit designs looked very unflattering in the initial reveal. Yeah, I remember a lot of us comparing it to Iron Man. Like, oh, what did Tony Stark make Power Rangers? I will admit that the attempt at a crystalline design looks so, much like much like with Green Lantern um, looks better in motion than it did than it did than it did at the time. But you do have you do have the age old issue of um, overcomplicated designs, which is something I've ranted about with um, su- with superhero adaptations over the years, and it's something I'm going to keep ranting about until until somebody gets the hint. <laughs> In that case, you'll be doing it until the day you die. Well, like, well, it's not it's not like I've it's not like I've got a shortage of anger. <laughs> <laughs> the it's the attempt the attempt at do, the i'd say i'd say the only th- the only thing when it came to the film that on, that honestly annoyed me was not something related to the film itself but related to how the how the media took to certain things namely having the, having their version of tr- having their version of Trini be a lesbian which in inst- which um that re- that really shouldn't have been jumped up that really shouldn't have been jumped for joy and and plastered all over the place yeah, because here's the thing. Like, if they had actually gone all in on that in the movie, all right, fine, you get your victor lap. But if you actually watch that scene, they don't actually... She doesn't really ag- 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 confirm anything. She just kind of stays vague about the whole thing. She could be lesbian, she could be bi, we don't know. We just, you know, she just she has some things she keeps close to the chest. So for them to say, "Oh, she's a, she, she's saying she's she's lesbian." No, she never said that. So why the hell are you promoting it that way? You are going to confuse the audience who goes to see this movie and goes, "The hell are they talking about?" Not to mention in do, in in, ta- in in focusing so much on that, you end up ta- you end up taking what came before completely out of co- completely out of context. Since that whole the whole the whole that whole scene is a pretty is a pretty well done essentially campfire moment where everybody is is tr- is trying to is trying to open up with each other. 
Yeah. The whole point is is that up until that point, they could not work together because they didn't know each other very well. They just all happened to be in detention for one reason or another, especially our, our Jason in this in, in this episode, movie, mm-hmm. who basically was not, you know, they were trying to establish that these guys aren't the goody goods from the old days. That These guys had problems. All of them had different problems. And it shows, the scene there actually shows that Trini is a lot more reserved, a lot more secretive. Like, even in that scene, they don't, she doesn't reveal that much about herself. Mm-hmm. So but that's that's what that was all about, and to to take away from the rest of the actors and the work that they did just to focus on this one very insignificant line. When Zach looks at her, and goes, "Oh, you got boy troubles?" Silence. Girl troubles, and she still does. And it's not like she suddenly changes her actions. She just just sits there. That just ruined, that just is like, it takes away from the narrative that was actually being told for the one you want to tell. Mm -hmm. And we all just love that around here, don't we? Yeah. (laughs) And, but be, but beyond, beyond that, it was a, it was a, it was a solid film. I understand, as I, as I understand, it didn't do, it didn't do all, it didn't do all that well box office wise, which is. Un- which is understandable because it kind of just showed right the fuck up out of nowhere with not a whole lot of um, promotion, and there and there's also the fact that um, I think that came out the same year as Pacific Rim, which you would think that they don't have any crossover with each other, but get but um there but there's enough on paper there's an, but given the fact that both of them are very tokusatsu influenced material it's just that one of them has a has a far more recognizable name yeah you know you see where this is going actually i just double checked pacific rim didn't co- oh no that's uh pacific rim uprising actually pacific rim came out several years prior cuz power rangers was in 2017 pacific rim was 2013 okay okay i take i take that back oh um, yeah but t- still I'd say I'd say the I'd say the other issue is um the tr- the um the d- the damage that Bayformers has done over the years. Yeah, that I think is a lot more of a logical argument because very much a lot of the CG used in Power Rangers was ve- especially for the Zords themselves mm-hmm. screamed Michael Bay. And especially when the Megazord came uh, was put together, it just—I mean, oh, I'm not a big fan of that. It did not look very good, and yeah, that—that that definitely screamed something that Michael Bay would have put together, and that probably put a bad image in people's minds. Mm-hmm. Which sucks because a lot of the other aspects of the movie—I mean, you've got Zordon actually having kind of a need to be free from his little trapped wall, and you know, almost being jealous of the other Rangers as a result of it. You know, so desperate to get out, and then only to realize, what the fuck am I doing? I need to help these kids, not force them to put get me out of this. Mm-hmm. And using their powers to basically rescue uh, Billy. You know, that was a good scene. You've got Elizabeth Banks just fucking tearing it up as Rita. And actually showing that she was the original Green Ranger back in the Mesozoic era. And that she just basically went rogue. Like, a lot of the aspects of that just really worked well. And it just sucks that people didn't get a chance to see that because they were focused on the superficial shit. Yeah. Now, gra- now granted, it'll be, it will be a bit weird for me to praise Elizabeth Banks when I put her in the clown car a few years ago. Hey, you know what? She has her, but she can have. She has her shit moments, but mm-hmm. this was one of the times where she fucking killed it. Yeah, <laughs> you can't, can't. We can't. We gotta give her. We gotta give her some credit. I uh, the old the old adage be, being "Give the devil his due." Yeah, though I don't like how they handled Goldar. That was that was dumb. Yeah the. And I know, I know, I know the whole Krispy Kreme thing ended up becoming ended up becoming a meme, but um, 
I get I get the feeling it was a case of look, there's look, they're bankrolling this film, so you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, I I forgive that one. I don't really give that much too much shit cuz it's like, yeah, I can see why they didn't have a choice. Um it's kind of like the whole Dr. Pepper thing with Godzilla in 1985, although it's not exactly it's not exactly um helping my case that I'm using that as my frame of reference. <laughs> But it, at the same time, it's a, it's a similar thing. Like they they are promote they are funding the movie, so they get to be promoted as a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And hey, Krispy Kreme certainly got uh, got paid for that. <laughs> they got their money back for that with how that meme blew up and their specialty donuts actually sold like hotcakes. Mm -hmm. But but um, th but then we get to the we get to two other um other things that were kind of stealing the thunder. Um, one of them, of course, being um, Hyperforce, which obviously, obviously, because it's me, <laughs> everybody <laughs> and their brother was 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 gi was giving was giving me guff about whether or not I knew about it. <laughs> like, how the fuck would you not know about it? <laughs> even if even if I wasn't the tabletop guy in our illustrious crew, how would I not when? The, when the adage that I, when the quote that I seem to be using a lot in my, a lot as Mildra is, I drink and I know things. <laughs> yeah, and to be fair, Hyperforce was very ambitious with what it was trying to do, mm -hmm. having a tabletop RPG and its own system to that fact, featuring real actors and real fans of the show. With guys like Andre the Black Nerd and Strawberry Seventeen mm -hmm. doing uh, playing a couple roles, along with you know Peter Sidarso, Christina V, and good old Polly, <laughs> and one of his in a role that I think he was better at than being bulk. He, I, I consider him to be the true to be the true MVP of 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 that um of that season. Um, yeah. I will. I will say that there were, there were, t there were two. Um, there were two. Uh, I ended up. Go I ended up watching all twenty episodes that they did, and um, I'd say one of the even more ambitious things is the fact that it. W this was advertised as being canon. That the events here would be integrated into the canon, which um, is going to lead to a problem that I'm going to get into in a minute. But first, hyper now hyper RPG was born of some offshoots from Geek and Sundry. The um the peop the people who bring the people who are responsible for cr for stuff like Critical Role and Will Wheaton's tabletop. Fuck you, Will Wheaton. <laughs> but Hatnan and um they had they had said from the get go this was going to be a twenty episode series. Everybody, everybody pretty much knew this. But and because of that, you have a limited amount of time that you can really work with. And they were and they had a direct liaison with them, with Saban who would show who would show up in the after shows. And they had plenty of get plenty of guests. Some of them be some of them being other actors and some of them being uh some of them being other um tabletop personalities. I I am of the I am of the opinion that when it came to when it came to the guest roles, the only guest character, oddly enough, who se who seemed to have the best grasp as to what the hell was go what the hell they were dealing with, oddly enough, was JDF. A lot of the other, a lot of the other guest appearances felt ridiculously out of place or weren't properly built up. Yeah. And now, gr now granted, now granted, his fir his first at his first attempt was a little bit awkward with him being with during the, during the um during the di during the Dino Thunder episodes, but he but he got better. And to be honest, everybody is awkward in their in their first run in in my world. <laughs> but I'd I'd say oh. I'd say one other one other minor issue that I think I think I need to address is I ultimately. I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if they just weren't legally allowed to, but I do think not put not putting only putting out a explanation video 
and not put and not putting out any sort of um any sort any sort of PDF involving the rule set itself was a mistake. It is I don't know I don't know the behind the scenes reasoning, but hyper hyper RPG and a lot of and a lot of other folks that do that ha that do this have this bad habit of not sharing their notes. Especially and normally if if the notes are just um stat blocks, I can certainly understand that. But when you're dealing with campaigns that are heavily homebrewed or flat out in house like this, I don't quite agree with that. But again, it could it's 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 entirely possible that it was out of their hands. Yeah. Um and that and um I I remember I remember when um Re when Renegade had th had their deal to make Power Rangers games and everybody was thinking hey maybe maybe Hyperforce will get adapted will get adapted there and I was like guys chill Renegade doesn't has only done one maybe two RPGs in the in their library that being Kids on Bikes and Overlight now grant now granted I end up having I end up having to eat crow about those words given recent events but I didn't know that at the time. Up until that point, they were mostly known as a board and card game company. But I'd say one of the bigger issues with um, Hyperforce was not utilizing their time effectively. When you've only got 20 episodes, you have very little room to do one-offs. That's not saying you can't do it, you just can't do it as often, especially if you're trying to tell a specific story. If you're just if it's just 20 if it's just 20 episodes of people fucking around like we did with Journey Through the Ninth World, that's fine. But they're built but they were building this as a proper season and doing a and doing a bait for a for a second season that was never going to happen. You don't if you unless you absolutely know you're going to be following up, you don't do that shit. Cuz all you're going to do yeah. is piss people off when you set when you set something up and you can't deliver. And but the but the but um because but because of but because of the pro of the prospect of what they were doing, as opposed to what was going on with with Ninja Steel, that was occupying the conversation. The bigger thing that was occupying the conversation was the growing popularity of the Boom Studios comics. Oh yeah, this this became the talk of the town very early on because. At, like when people first were hearing about Boom Studios doing a Power Rangers comic, they weren't exactly like jumping on the on board because like, oh, okay, we'll see how this plays out. But little by little, something was starting to develop, and it started growing fast, especially once a certain story arc started uh, started uh, happening. Mm -hmm. Because and, and right out, and, and as someone who's actually read the majority, like the first couple of major story arcs of, of this up until the big one or up through the big one and even a little beyond it i will tell you right out the gate these guys put their heart and soul into these comics wanting to give us a new take on mighty morphin power rangers which incorporated which then started to incorporate the entire franchise and this gives a big Big props to the main writer of the comics early run, Kyle Higgins, who clearly knew what he was getting himself into this time. And the reason the reason why this kind of thing stands out is usually with usually there's there's a bit of a cultural understanding with tie-in comics that they're going to be a ball of meh. You know, they're made they're they're made they're made to drum up hype for what they what people are actually supposed to be spending money on. Or the or their tertiary material that does that doesn't that doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. But that wasn't the case. Given not only did they expand, but then they end up introducing their own entries into the mythos. Yeah, it's they they start with adding on to the Green Ranger storyline. They start at the end of the Green Ranger saga, and create an alternate time an alternate telling of events where. Tommy has a little bit of an issues, has some after effects dealing with the doing with the green power coin, 
and, you know, being evil for several episodes, hearing Rita's voice in his head, and then, then things take a turn when a, a black dragon mech shows up and gives them all sorts of hell, leading to an alternate universe where Tommy doesn't turn good, and in fact, goes so evil, he kills Rita, and adopts a new power set, and the introduction of one of the greatest things the comics ever introduced, even if it did get a little overhyped eventually, Lord Draken. And it's very, given the given the glut given the glut of evil supermans that ha, that have fe, that have festooned pop culture over the last decade, it's easy to look at this kind of thing and and roll and roll your eyes. But the but the thing the thing is. The reason I'd say the reason why there's two reasons why this ended up working as well as it did, especially for the Shattered Grid um, event. One is the fact that everybody is the fact that um, Tommy had Tommy had started out as a villain, so you d so you always have you always have that level of what if. Second, um, the stuff that the stuff that happened to him over the years. It's a miracle, like just just with the stuff that happened with him when he, when he was Doctor O. It's a miracle he didn't snap. Yeah, Th this was basically a chance to us for us for us and for Tommy to see himself in a mirror darkly. Mm -hmm. And the third the third factor is the f is the fact that they and they did not half ass this. No, <laughs> they did not. Like you know, introducing the entire Power Rangers universe into the continuity of their comic books and making it an epic event on the scale of, um... Oh, fuck. My mind's blanking on DC's big event. A Christ, the uh, DC-style crisis. Yeah, this was a crisis-level event, and it was treated with the same level of gravitas as the original Crisis on Infinite Earths. Mm -hmm. sh that really sold the idea that this Shattered Grid storyline was worth picking up and I bought many issues of this because I wanted to see what was going on and I'm not one to buy comics anymore so that should tell you something yeah and um there's there's of course that throughout the throughout this you have you have um you have the you have the fact that the that the design ended up going ended up going through several end up going up going through several phases but ulti ultimately one one of the things that this ended up showing was was um the fact that since the, since this was a comic and since they didn't have to have to be under the whole the whole lens of this is this is a comic that's clearly made for people who have been longtime fans mm. and they and they don't and they don't have to they don't have to follow the same set of rules especially since um well the comics code authority has long has long been has long since been dead. It's been more. It's been more or less ineffectual since the two since the two thousands. And the, and thus and thus they and while obviously they know they know not to go too far, not to go too far into the dark. Um, there's a lot more that they can do with the comic that they couldn't do on any on any show, and they take advantage of that. Hell, one of the first like the second issue of the actual Shattered Grid storyline. Has freaking Tommy get killed by his dark self, flat out, mm -hmm. just stabbed right in the back. And because of because of how, because of the fact that the that these entries, Hyperforce and um and the and the Boom Studios comic, were occupying so much of the conversation, it ends up it ends up leaving the um it ends up leaving the television stuff. Kind of, um, kind of as the third wheel. The irony of it all. It, and I'd, I'd, um, and after, and after that, I'm not, I, um, has it, has, has there been, has there been any information given as to what, as to why, um, Haim Saban decided to cut his losses? Uh, I not to my knowledge. I mean, I'd have to go digging and I could probably find something, but if I were to if I if I'm going to speculate on this, I would speculate that after the disaster that was Megaforce, 
the, 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 the returns already started diminishing. He was already realizing that this was now becoming a sunken cost fallacy for him. Mm-hmm. That to keep this going would have just taken more money away. And like I've said before, Haim Saban is a guy who likes to spend as little as he can get away with. So I think at some point he realized this wasn't going to work. He wasn't going to be able to make the money he thought he was going to make from bringing Power Rangers back into the mainstream. So that's when he was like, that's when he started looking for a buyer. And thus, at the end of our tale here, he sell, he sells the Power Rangers IP. It starts with just the toy line, but then I think he realized that he would make a lot more money if he just sold the franchise outright and thus hands the reins over to Hasbro where the where the now where it now sits to this day. And we could go into that, but it's not necessary to simply say, we'll just simply say Hasbro's done good so far, but the jury's still out altogether. The, there, now at the very, at the very least, when it comes, when it comes to, when it comes to the toy end of things, they've done very well for themselves with the lightning collection. Um, I never, I never thought, I never thought that, um, that the that I'd see that I'd see pro, that I'd see a proper fighting game. Um, granted, it granted it was a fighting game that was get, that was gonna get overshadowed because that, because the conversation in that scene was all about um, Dragon Ball Fighter Z. True, but I will say that a lot of people have actually gone back, especially after more updates of uh, in Battle for the Grid, mm-hmm. and it's getting a lot more love than you would think. Like a lot of fighting game experts are looking at this again, uh, taking a second look and going, you know what? It's not the greatest. Like I don't see this being tournament worthy, but it's actually not all that bad. It games like this are in the t- in, in the tier of party fighters. As an aside, that's the reason why I was always against trying to make tournaments out of Smash. It's never really been built for that kind of thing. No, though, Battle for the Grid's kind of in a middle ground. Like it it has elements of a party fighter. But it does have some actual fighting game mechanics to it. So, like, again, it's kind of in a middle ground on that regard. But And, and that's another thing. We didn't mention that either. Like, in, to tie into the, to the Shattered Grid story arc, it's, Battle for the Grid started as a, uh, as a mobile game. Yeah, Legacy Wars. Which, pa- Power um, Rangers Legacy Wars, which was okay. It was, your, you know, it, was a, it was a pretty decent fighter with some, like, you, you pick three attacks. You've got some comp buddies to help you out. And it's got a gotcha system, which, you know, anyone who knows me knows how I feel about any kind of gotcha system. But, but go ahead. it evolved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it evolved, and they turned it into a full-fledged game with Battle for the Grid, where it's got DLC, sure, but it's a much more fleshed-out game. It's got a storyline that's based on the Shattered Grid story arc with some, like, minor tweaks. And is actually kind of fun. I actually own it myself. Mm-hmm. Now, and it's cer- it's certain it's certainly a, it's certainly a step up from the from the closest thing that we got to de- to a decent um, fighting game in this in this IP is what is when people get creative with Mugen and um, that's a dice roll at the best of times. Yeah, to be fair, Power Rangers Fighting Edition back in the old days was pretty good, but I hadn't seen much since then. To be fair, mm-hmm. like I said, the closest the, I've seen I've seen a few. Um, attempts at Tokusatsu Mugen, but um, uh, but it's very very slim pickings. That's kind of why I've been actually uh, over the years working on my own. Mm-hmm. I actually have because people have made Mugen fighters for Common Rider, and I've actually kind of put together my own thing. Yeah. Now, at the end at the end of the di- at the end of the day, I'd say. I something that I always try I always try and delve into with these kind of things is it's easy for it's easy for us to just to just laugh at the fail but I'd say one question worth exploring is what can we learn from the failure of the Neo Saban era For me personally I'd say one I'd say one of the learning experiences is to be is to beware of chasing nostalgia Hmm um, I'd say an, I'd say another thing is is obviously um, obviously pl- obviously plan ahead and realize that if you want to make money, you're gonna have to spend money. Yeah, 
I, I think the Hasbro era has already proven that with Beast Morphers. Mm -hmm. They spent the money, but boy, did they make it back. But yeah, chasing nostalgia, you know, having nostalgic moments is all fine and dandy. Again, Beast Morphers did it in all the right ways. Oh, aside from a couple minor missteps, I'm sorry, the crossover episode was kind of weak. I mean, I love having Jason back for an episode, but it didn't do what he needed to do. But chasing nostalgic, trying to capture a moment in time that has long since passed and not realizing what made that work to do it again, that's where you need to learn don't do that because you will only end up hurting yourself trying. Mm hmm. And I'd I would say I would say something I would say something else is um you have you have to you have to acknowledge that adaptation is not is not this is not the same as um j is not the same as straight translation. There are in it, and this does this doesn't just apply with um Japanese media into English. Adapting from what from one language or culture into another is so, is something that you have to approach with a significant amount of care. And if I need to use a non-Japanese example for this kind of thing, I'd actually use um, I'd actually use the Metro series of books, um, which it which it which so forms the foundation of the Metro series of video games, Metro twenty thirty three, X um, Le um, Exodus and the like. Um. Russian is not an is not a language that translates easily, and translators effectively have to be writers as well as well as translators, because you need to get equal parts of context as well as the wording that's actually used. And of and and because because of that, it's it's nice. To, it is nice to be. It is admirable to be a fan. But you do have to. Temper that um, that fa that fanness, and make sh and make sure that it doesn't blind you. Zacher is Zacher is an is an example of um, someone who of someone who would think that doing a more doing a more that all you need to do is just a straight adaptation of the source material and the rest will write itself. That in doing that you're respecting what came before, but you're not. You're you're do, you're ultimately only going to be doing a pale imitation when you do that, and I'd and I'd say I'd say those are, those are the big those are the biggest lessons of all. Learn from your past. Don't try to copy it. Mm -hmm. As isn't the isn't the old adage go? Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. <laughs> Why do we see that in spades? Yeah. Now, for fortunate, fortunately, um, while it, while it's very while it's very clear that hi that um the closest thing to hyperforce coming back is get is getting glorified cameos in other in other media, um, it is good to see that um bo that Boom Studios isn't go isn't going anywhere. And f in fact, they've been, in fact so they've been doing better than ever. What with the fact that they're that Keanu Reeves is working on a comic with them. <laughs> Who is? You kind of cut off there. Keanu Reeves is working on a comic with them. Son of a bitch! I didn't hear about this. This has been a, this has been a, this has been in the works for a while. Keanu Reeves is working on a comic called Berserker. And Boom Studios oh. is pu is had kickstarted and pub is publishing. Oh, uh, maybe I did hear about that, but anyway. Yeah, a bunch of comic pros got bit got pissy over the over the fact over asking why does why do they have to do why do they have to use Kickstarter for this? Um. To that I say, why do so many indie comic people use it? Use Kickstarter or Indiegogo. This is how, this is. It's a good. It's a good way to for a lot of companies to drum up hype. It don't hate the player, hate the game. And just besides, would who, would you rather would you rather have him go to Warner or DC with this kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> Especially since Berserker, as the as evidenced by the name, is not going to be a nice kind of comic. It's going to be a it's going to be a blood fest. To the point to the point where I may as well consider reading it with doom music. But 
and yeah, and yeah, the full, the there's a bit of full circle ness once again with the recent announcement of um of Power Rangers getting a proper RPG published by Renegade using the Essence Twenty system, along along with um Transformers and GI Joe, which um. Good luck. Good luck. You. Good luck. Pro good luck putting out three separate games at the same relative time with this system. I'm not. A, I'm, it's not exactly something I would have done personally, but it is what it is. And yeah, when the when the time comes, I will probably I'll probably either do a Valley of the Judged or or the like on that on that particular book. I'm not going to be getting the limited edition version where they did. Where they did, where they have several versions of it, each for each of the original colors. I'm not do, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Save that kind of shit for the whales. I'm, I'm a little too skinny to be a whale. <laughs> but all, all, thi all things being said, when you see some, when you see someone talking about how how great the good old days of of the '90s era was, um, point and laugh at them. Because, 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 because if because any time any time that somebody wants to bring up how 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 the more modern stuff isn't as good, have them remember the time that the that the old school tried to be brought back, without understanding what made it great. I think that is what um, is going to be the legacy of the Neo Saban era: a cautionary tale. Pretty much. And I think that is as good a spot as any to act as a capstone for this for this episode of Geek Watch. Now I've got I've got a few in, I've got a few interesting um, interviews interviews lined up throughout this week. Some of some of them RPG related, some of them comic related, and so, and some of them re related to related to some really fun stuff. <laughs> You'll see. You'll see that. You'll see that um, fairly short. Fairly shortly. And of and of course, next week we'll be back with an, we'll be back with another episode of Geek Watch Insanity. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk, and join the watch. <laughs>